Hey everyone, welcome back to your full crew podcast. I'm Don Zoldai, CEO of P3 Tech Consulting and one of your co-hosts. And I'm Mike Peel, your other co-host. We've got some great topics we're going to be talking about today. Uh, what is the FAA's AAM uh, plan for the next five years? Um, we're going to be talking about the hacking of a space satellite via DEF CON. So that's a uh, pretty interesting uh, kind of occurrence there. Um, and then we're also going to be talking more space stuff about the Russians crash landing on the moon and the Indians actually landing on the moon. And then we're going to end the show with some stuff about uh, AI copyright uh, that I want to say we probably predicted a couple months ago. So we're really excited to see some big developments on the copyright front in terms of AI uh, or generative AI. We've got some great guests to talk about these things today. And I'm going to start with Sam. So Sam, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Hello, guys. Hello, Don, Mike, uh, Trent. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Sam. Um, I'm founder and the chief product officer at Speedbird. Aero. Uh, so we've been working with uh, drones or UAS for the past eight years, uh, especially uh, developing systems and aircraft for cargo and cargo drones. And, uh, so we've been working uh, hand by hand with regulators, uh, certifying, like paving the way for uh, drones um, to be, I mean, to be uh, among many, many other uh, types of means of transportation, if I, if I can say so. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I hope I can collaborate with you guys and add insights and comments and opinions. I hope, hope we'll have some fun here. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun today. So we, we've got another great guest, and that's, that's going to be Trent. So Trent, tell us a little bit about yourself, if our audience hasn't already seen your full tilt appearance. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, Trent Taima, president of CSG Strategies, based out of the Washington, D.C. area. It's a, I run a counter threat consultancy specializing in cybersecurity, technology security, and infrastructure protection. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. And if you have missed it, go back and see uh, Trent's Full Tilt episode. It's got a really storied history that's extremely interesting. And uh, we'll be covering some of the topics of his career uh, in the second article. But first up, we have um, some news about the FAA releasing a plan about advanced air mobility, which uh, everybody's been waiting for with bated breath for quite some time. So Sam, tell us a little bit about this article, why you chose it, and what you uh, think the main insights are. OK, yes. Um, well, this is a very nice article uh, because it brings uh, this new Innovative uh, 28 initiative, right? It's from um, the FAA government, uh, I'm sorry, the government of, of the US, right? The FAA administration. And um, the thing is, they are starting to have these uh, concept of operations, the CONOPS for AAM and even for UAM, for the urban ones. Um, and especially they are trying to have all the framework or the foundation of how this should be certified and how these aircraft will be operated and especially how type certification should be, um, uh, I mean, configured for this specific aircraft, which is brand new novel airframes. And uh, you have uh, different types of configurations of um, you have uh, electric motors, uh, you have some level of autonomy. Okay, this will start with pilots, but maybe in the future there will be more autonomy, more um, automated flights for these aircraft. And I think this article will talk about this. And the, the great thing, I, I mean, the great insight in this article for me is that it targets 2028 as a date for going live for some of these companies and which is quite fast in my opinion uh, especially when it it talks about aircraft certification usually it takes a long time but uh, this initiative that brings all these companies together all the regulators i mean hands-on uh, work uh, everybody working together in working groups uh, this will make i don't know probably as fast as i could 
think about. I mean, to have these live in our skies, that's amazing. So that's the main side for me for this article. Awesome. Awesome is right. So uh, Trent, what are your thoughts on AIM in general and uh, what's going on with the FAA in, in terms of the strategic plan? No, I like this a lot. I mean, as we're moving forward, because as, as the F FAA works more, you know, the public-private interaction, it's, I think, uh, clearing the field so making it easier for people who want to use drones can. Uh, there's the, it's still, from my impression, is that there's this conflict between who can use it and where and you know, line of sight versus non line of sight and all these complications coming out of it. So I'm happy to see that there, there's a move forward that they're taking it seriously. You know, Trent, you you raise a great point. You know, words matter, and I think people uh, don't fully appreciate that advanced air mobility. It's not just the very large air taxis, the electric vertical takeoff and landing, but it also includes some of these complex drone operations like drone delivery that Samuel's talking about. But this this plan really talks quite a bit about those air taxis, if you will, uh, what we call the eVTOL aircraft in. Sam, I, I agree with you. There's some good stuff in here. If people take the time to read it, uh, I will say I was, um, you know, at the FAA's uh, AAM summit in Baltimore, Maryland, a couple weeks ago, and this plan had come out just before that. And certainly, speakers from the stage mentioned it in passing, like, "Hey, there's a plan." But what I was frankly disappointed about was the lack of really a deep dive into it. Like, okay, well, tell me more about it. Like, why, why is it this? And, you know, what can we expect? Um, so you kind of have to everybody go out there and actually read the, the no kidding plan yourself. Uh, but some things this article highlights that I thought were important was the type certification as a special class uh, for these aircraft under 14 CFR uh, 21.17B, uh, which is something that has been discussed for a long time. Um, it says there's going to be a, a FAR Part 135 compliance required for operators and pilot type ratings. Uh, we've seen that with drone delivery, but you know, again, they're just saying, hey, for these air taxis, it, it, this is an airline. You know, you're you're going to have to comply with Part 135. Uh, they're talking primarily uh, operations in Class B and C airspace. Uh, unlike drones, right now they're saying these must have AS ADSB out. Uh, and operational transponders with altitude reporting. Uh, and I think, um, Sam, to your point of 2028 and why that date, why that mark on the wall, uh, because I believe it's supposed to correlate with the Olympics. Uh, and, you know, to have almost like what you're seeing in Paris, they're throwing out there, hey, we're going to have air taxis by, you know, by, what is that, 2024 next year? Uh, you know, for our Olympics, we're saying, yeah, we'll, we'll be there 2025 for, for uh, when it comes to the U.S. So uh, I believe that's the kind of 2028 um, hot button why they're looking at, at that. What do you think, Mike? Well, just on that, uh, 20, by 2024, um, used for the Olympics, uh, what was it, Paris? Yeah. Um, I say good luck on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> probably would be like a very limited scope if it is at all like um more for like a singular mission to say we did it than um to actually have running air taxis for vips um but 2028 in the united states okay uh well the thing that i like is um also the um, statement to use existing airports and heliports yeah. uh, with vertiport modifications because we've discussed with plenty of people on the show, actually on all of your shows, Don, um, you know, vertiports and, and, and uh, modifying existing infrastructure has come up as really one of the only ways to build out the necessary safety uh, infrastructure for these uh, complex machines, but also the support infrastructure too. How do they charge? Um, you know, if you're if you're working with existing airports, you're not building from scratch, and the type of infrastructure this stuff needs is expensive. So I thought that was uh, really important. And like you said, type certification popped out right to me right away because when something's type certified, that just makes it easier to build to that spec. So there's less risk for the manufacturer. 
uh, to make a product that then isn't usable or requires special uh, authorization just to be used at all. Um, so we got actually a good question, and I'll throw this uh, to the speakers. Has the business model work, been worked out so that they can serve the masses? Um, I would say no. Um, you know, are people working it out? No. Yeah, I don't, I don't know who asked that. Uh, I'd love to hear Sam's Zio Air. Boss too. Who was it? Zio Air. Oh, okay. Bronwyn Morgan, our, uh, our oh, buddy. Oh, uh, Bronwyn. In fact, Bronwyn's going to be hosting the show at the end of September. So, um, you know, Bronwyn, so many people have different models, right? But I, I think a lot of these... Um, you know, Archer, you look at uh, Archer is, is talking about almost like being the Uber of the sky, you know, with these short hops from, you know, they've already worked with United Airlines to have uh, a, a hop from downtown Manhattan to Newark uh, Airport. And I think that's kind of that model of like, hey, we're going to be, you know, the same price essentially as usual black. Uh, just making people's lives easier. But I think there are a lot of lot of different models out there. Like the regional air mobility people, like tra our buddy Transcend Air, uh, Peter Schmidt. Now his is an eVTOL. He's got a hybrid model, but you know he's looking at those hops from Philly to Boston. You know, so a little bit longer distances and using viports that are on the water uh, versus maybe an airport like you would see with uh, United and, and Archer. So. I, I think, you know, the bottom line is I don't think the models are worked out. Uh, I think everybody's got their own vision. I don't know that this plan gave a lot of clarity to that. Um, but you know what? I think the market will sort it out. What do you think, Sam? Oh, yeah, uh, the, it's been worked out, of course. Um, uh, I remember when we participated on a, um, <clears throat> it's a project, uh, it's a CONOPS actually in Chicago. Uh, with the e air mobility team, so uh, we were integrating drones with the actual operation they have. So uh, basically, as I see, the thing is, we want to have these vehicles available for anyone to use them, like the same way you use the underground, right? We would like to use an EV talk, or we'd like to uh, just to move ourselves around the city. Uh, with a reasonable price, right? And it's not for the the riches to use those aircraft. So uh, if you think about, let's say, all these underground of these skies, I can say like that, but that's the idea, is to have uh, these electric vehicles available for the masses and everybody can move from one point to another one. I mean, move faster and more effective in the city. Um, so, we could see that with uh, the current infrastructure, right? So we were using Vertiport Chicago. Uh, it's uh, they, they have a lot of helipads, the helicopters operating. So uh, we use one of the helicopters to simulate what would be uh, a trip, right? An actual EVTOL trip, but it was a helicopter. So the experience was since we buy the ticket and we have all the way to the vehicle and they have the flights and then you arrive at that destination. Uh, there you have another infrastructure. It's very well organized. So what we could see was the experience of using this technology in the future. Um, so it is doing that quite well, in my opinion. So they have different conops around the world uh, with different regulatory agencies to figure out the best model, right? So I see that all the companies is more focused in the aircraft development and manufacturing, but um, the experience at least I have and we in Speedbird we have was, okay, um, if we think about vehicle, if we imagine the vehicle is ready, how would be the whole experience for me, for you, for Mike, right? And I can see that it was amazing. So if it will be like that in the future, it will be amazing. I'll be I'll be taking it all like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So we got an interesting comment from Kaye Cruz. Uh, the advertisement model will be built into the Skyports as part of the revenue model. Yeah. So um, I, I wonder if they mean, uh, are these going to be flying billboards? Well, <laughs> that might be something. Already got that. Or, or just uh, general advertising because nobody's flying, so they could put a, you know, a video right in your face like they do in the cabs. 
Interesting. Um, so interesting thought. Chew on that. But we're about to go to space. So um, our next article is from Trent. So for the first time, the U.S. government lets hackers break into a satellite in space. For those of you who know what DEF CON is, uh, or actually for those of you who don't, it's a hacker conference um, and pretty well-known one. Uh, but this is the biggest thing I've ever seen done at one. So Trent, tell us about it and why you thought this article was important. Yeah, this is, well, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. So um, this was Hackasat 4. Um, this is the fourth competition they've had at DEF CON. And um, it's the first time that in cooperation with the US Air Force and US Space Force, that there's a coordinated competition to hack a sat in orbit. So if you want to think about it, you're you're doing a remote hack in orbit through a ground station. And so, you know, satellites are basically very sophisticated drones that you have up there. And an Italian team was the first one to, to win this year out of five competitors. Now there were 700 entrants who tried to get in and it came down to the five or six contestants, I guess. And then eventually the Italian team hit it. Was really interesting thing about it. So you got to think about it. it. It's a 3U CubeSat, so it's kind of a flat sat. It's not very big. It's up there, but you figure it's in low Earth orbit. It's about 17,500 kilometers up, and it's doing. I'm excuse me. That's about 800 kilometers up, and it's doing 17,500 kilometers an hour. So it's it's going fast. And so when they hack in through the ground station, they go up. What the, the test is to find out is basically protecting edge computing, protecting uh, satellites while they're up there, and how do you how do you control it? Because that's truly the same thing like a drone that we fly here at Terrestrial. You have that up in orbit, and you're hacking in, so what do you do about it? Because it's, it's 17,500 kilometers up. I'm remotely getting in. I'm taking over it. I'm making it happen. So the first place winner who won... Uh, $50,000 was M Hackeroni. Um, it was a, a conglomeration of five Italian cyber research teams. Uh, the second team was a Polish team. Um, and they got 30 grand out of it. And uh, US team placed third with 20 grand. It's really exciting because you actually, they had a digital twin when you're at the, in the satellite, in the satellite village at DEF CON. So you can see it. So it's not like, okay, most hacking, you have the keyboard and, it's not much to see. They had a digital twin, so you could actually see what's going on back and forth. Um, to give you context, though, you know, this is the first one that Space Force, Air Force got together to make this happen. But in about 2022, publicly, uh, there's research done where um, there were approximately since 1975 to 2022, there have been 77 packs that have been publicly reported. Now, there may be more that are classified that we don't know about. Um, I know when I was in the FBI, I worked several cases where um, horrible assets were attacked. But if you think about it, there were 77 from 1975 to 2022, 75 either satellites or ground stations were hit. So this kind of shows where we're going. Okay, so what do I care? There's a big pivot between old space, which is, think, Sputnik, the International Space Station, right? Walking on the moon to uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos now going into commercial space. There's, we've now moved into that commercial space realm where it's no longer solely the government or you know the three big governments, US, China, Russia. Now it's, it's private companies that are taking over. Well, now as more and more companies launch stuff into orbit or towards the moon, how do you secure it? And what does that mean? Because you can see a uh, transition as a, as a society. And this also directly aligns with drones as we talk about it, because, you know, how we control it is usually, you know, it's RF, it's high frequency or it's cellular. Well, now you're going to be able to probably control them from space. So what does that mean? So this is a big change of where we're going. Really exciting, great, uh, great competition and really kind of showing where we're going for it. Yeah, it's certainly exciting. Um, space, the final frontier, right? But uh, I'm just fascinated um, about what uh, the U.S. government being um, s s working with hackers in this intelligent way to bolster our cybersecurity, right? 
um, this is exactly how it should be done. And it, that's really kind of what excites me the most about it. Um, so not all hackers are bad, right? No, uh, but, Sam, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, um, OK, so it's interesting to see that because um, as a software development background, uh, as I have, so we usually use uh, companies um, to do hacking. That's interesting to see that. Uh, I remember when we were developing in the past uh, telemedicine systems. So uh, we hired these companies to break into those systems. We would like to see and to learn what we need to improve, right? So uh, some points in some areas uh, we were weak and then uh, all these hacking work, if I can say, it helps a lot. It helps a lot to evolve, especially in cybersecurity. And when you are dealing with uh, information that is kind of, you know, not classified, but you, you you cannot just use a patient information and broadcast to anywhere, right? That's private. Um, so I think the same happens with governments, especially like satellites, like Trent said with the article. Um, we have tons of different satellites up there, right? Military, like civilians. And I mean, um, it's it, it's concerning to think about someone who could hack that and take control and what, what would happen. So uh, this type of initiatives, I mean, that's key to evolve in security and cybersecurity, of course. I mean, uh, I full support that. Yeah, I was yeah, going to you know, add, um, mm -hmm. you know, most people don't realize how important space is to everything we do. I mean, when you think about GPS, imagine a day in your life without GPS. Like, I wouldn't be able to get around the block, probably, right? Because I put in my ways and that tells me where, you know, the directions of where I'm supposed to go. And GPS, for those that, that don't know, everybody knows, oh, GPS, GPS. I mean, that's a system of 13 military satellites. I mean, that, that, that's what started this thing, right? And and Russia has their own called GLONASS and uh, China has their own uh, system called BDAO and uh, Europe has a system. So, um, you know, just GPS and, and GNSS, uh, Global Navigation and uh, Satellite Systems alone, uh, you know, impact everyday life. Now, when it comes to drones and advanced air mobility, and the things we just talked about with the last article, critical, critical capabilities here, not only the GPS, GNSS, PNT, position navigation timing, but also the communications links and things like that. Uh, so, you know, the fact that that they're looking at this is key and, and Trent, that's really scary to hear that, that we already know, at least publicly, uh, there's been 22 hacks just really in the past year. Seven. seven. 27 hacks. Uh, did you see the interagency memo that just went out? There's a warning that have just, I don't know if it was uh, the, the cybersecurity, uh, CISA, right? DHS CISA, I think, put out some kind of an informational bulletin about satellite vulnerabilities to hacking. Uh, and I don't know if that was related to this competition, but I, I did see something pop up uh, in, in my feed about that. Exactly. So national, the DNI's national counter counterintelligence, National Counterintelligence and Security Center, NCSC, oh. with the FBI and U.S. Uh, Air Force OSI, put out a two-page threat bulletin on how to commercial companies to protect your satellites and the risk of sealing IP and how they can be compromised. Um, it just came out, and I'll be happy to share it with you so you can post it on your, uh, on your site. Awesome. Thank you. Trent, there was a, something you wanted to add? Well, that was that was what I was going to add, and uh, Don oh, oh. heated up nicely. But also, just give you a little context, is if it even take it into the Russian-Ukrainian conflict war, is uh, Starlink has had yes. a major role in that. And the interesting okay. thing about it is because that constellation has allowed uh, command and control and communication into that contested environment, and what the Russians found out is what they'd used to traditionally deny and degrade communications in that area, there's too many satellites in low Earth orbit. So they're always, it's always, you know, just near the horizon so they can always get a signal and you can't block out that much of the sky. And so there's this whole conversation about, you know, the next step is, are they going to get adversarial towards 
stuff in orbit that caused a lot of discussions between the countries. And so where the Russians last I read, were actually targeting the receivers. But you can see where a commercial provider is now really changing how everything happens. It's a big game changer for the Ukrainians. Yeah, it, it also puts the uh, commercial provider right in the middle of uh, a, a nasty state versus state uh, situation, yep. right? Um, Big crosshairs. And yeah, so like, you know, we're we're very pro free market, right? And not only America, but in the West. Um, but does that bring in uh, unnecessary vulnerabilities in war zones? So something to, to kind of contemplate. Or better there. yet, spill over to the commercial and civil sector. I mean, we Mike, we talked about this on a previous full crew, you know, Elon's putting this out there and he's using it in war. Well, there's a lot of private uh, civil users. Yeah, he tried to pull the ladder up and charge more. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you know, like, like which was typical, like you know, Silicon Valley disruptor behavior. But like, it's a different type of market yeah. when you're dealing with military. Well, and you, you made know, it so. a dual use technology. The point yeah. is that you know now you've created vulnerabilities for every other user because you're employing it in warfare, right? So, uh, that, so that's significant. Yeah. Well, it makes it a legitimate military target, too. Well, so, it I mean, does, but, you know, like, right. so you have to think about proportionality. If you're following the law of war, you know, yeah. does the military objective gain outweigh the, the significantly outweigh the civilian harm, right? But by the way, fun fact, everybody, mark your calendars now, April 22nd, Monday, Law Tech Connect, uh, <laughs> third annual edition at AUVSI Expo in San Diego. We're having a space and spectrum panel. For this very reason, because people aren't talking about this and it's so important. Yeah, well, one of the biggest changes, uh, you know, Trent brought up commercialization, but there's also sheer volume of satellites now, right? So that that kind of fell into what he was talking about with the Russians being unable to black out the sky in any reasonable way. Um, so this is going to be just another infrastructure layer, the same way that we think of phone lines. Mm -hmm. but they're in space so all the kind of necessary protections that go along with that we we have to think about now with satellites well you know so mike what uh um they're looking at they want five thousand satellites as part of the starlink constellation wow that's incredible that's their target goal so that means com continuous coverage around the world and all of those are meshed together and that's, and just that's the largest company but there are other players uh, well we yeah, so <laughs> a lot to chew on there. We got to take a short break just to thank our sponsors. Um, so actually, uh, Trent, thankfully sponsored. Uh, thank you, Trent, for sponsoring us uh, over a month ago. Um, so we got CSG Strategies. Very grateful to have them. Drone Up, Aero Vigilance, and oh my God, uh, Rupert Claw. Yes, Jonathan. So. Uh, we thank our sponsors for making this show possible, um, but we also want to thank our audience for participating today. The show is live, so if you want to add some more comments, uh, feel free to. The next article we're going to dive into, we're not coming back from space yet. Uh, this time we're going to the moon, though. So, uh, Dawn, tell us what happened with, uh, with the Russians. Doesn't seem like they had a good day on the moon. They had a really bad day on the moon. Uh, so their Luna 28 spacecraft crashed into the moon. Uh, due to uncontrolled orbit, uh, they did confirm that it's a really it's a big black eye for the Russians. You know, when you think about the space race and the original kind of U.S. Russian competition there, uh, you know, and how far essentially they've fallen, maybe in part due to economic sanctions, maybe in part to being kind of distracted with this war that they've fomented with uh, Ukraine uh, and not given the love uh, to their NASA equivalent uh, cause called Roscosmos. Uh, and, you know, so it crashed, but, you know, so much has happened since I picked this article last week. Uh, the Indian uh, government landed on the moon. Now, this is a an uncrewed mission. Uh, they have a rover that landed. Uh, well, they have the, the, the actual air uh, rocket that landed, but also rovers that are now going around the moon collecting uh, data, which is really, really cool. Now, why do we care about this? You know, we're talking about, uh, you know, satellites and how important they are uh, to everyday life. Uh, why the moon? Why do people care? 
You know, we had Joe Landon on here uh, a little bit ago from Crescent Space, that's a Lockheed Martin subsidiary, uh, where they're putting up satellites actually in the moon's orbit to create PNT for the moon for a future lunar economy, right? The idea is maybe having some kind of a sp a space stations there, uh, but the moon being kind of that launch pad uh, into further, um, you know, further areas of space. Uh, and also this idea of moon ice and what are the implications of that? You know, can, do, do, can refueling occur on the moon? Uh, if there's water that in the form of this ice that could be converted into water, you know, drinkable for, for human consumption, you know, all the, the regolith, which is the soil, you know, what are we finding there? So a lot of exploration on the moon and this South Pole area is where we're seeing the frozen water reserves. Uh, and, you know, again, this idea of the future of space missions to the moon and beyond. We know the Artemis, uh, was it Artemis II, Mike? Um, they're looking to put uh, humans back on the moon in the next couple of years, uh, NASA is. Uh, but to have India up there, so many other countries, you know, you guys were just talking about uh, the commercial uh, space, you know, if you will. But it's it's not just the big players anymore. Uh, it's not only commercial. It's it's these other countries that are uh, reaching these new heights, and it's it's really exciting to see uh, see see what's happening there. So that's why I picked this article. I thought it was really interesting. Well, I think it's an amazing success for India, right? And um, you know, for a long time, even though there are other space programs worldwide, the two most successful to talk about were the U.S. and Russian. So um, to see uh, India, you know, get such a strong foothold on what is clearly a goal for many nations is, I think, uh, an interesting development. And I think it speaks to how the technology um, has become more accessible in general. Um, and I think this forces us to think about it, though. Like, are we going to have little moon wars now? So, uh, how is the <laughs> how is this space going to be divvied up? And is this um, a possible point for nations to shake hand, or is it one for them to start disputing? Uh, and I guess uh, we're just getting started there. So, something to keep an eye on. I'd love to hear Spencer, thoughts. Sam. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, this is, a uh, so going to the moon and landing the moon. So that, uh, that makes India the fourth nation to be in the moon. So U S Russia, China, India. Now India has got the rover going around. The interesting thing about it is we can't colonize Mars or go to Mars until we figure out how to live in space. So I think the moon's the interim. It's, it's very interesting. Once we start putting bases there, mining's already going on. Uh, just a side note, China earlier this year actually did m mining and brought stuff back and knew they were able to bring helium-3 back to Earth, so testing out what's out there. The idea is going further, mining into other asteroids. Uh, interesting thing, there is the big effort, like you mentioned, Don, to put satellites around in lunar orbit, low lunar orbit, middle lunar orbit. Now, an interesting thing with the moon is because they don't have an atmosphere, it's not the same thing as it. so it's very irregular so when you have something in low lunar orbit around the moon it kind of uh it's an, it, it bounces because you're actually you know it, it depends on the mass of the moon because you're using the gravity it's a different thing it's not a smooth orbit or elliptical orbit that we're used to with um the earth it's totally changed the game because now you got us russia china india who's next going to the moon to mike's point what does that mean uh, I think the colony, first colony, will be on the moon. But the the other thing that always just still blows my mind about the moon, and, I, and, and there's a lot of um, space scientists out there that probably explain it to me. But the you know the day side's always the day side, the night side's always the night side. So where they look like they're going to set up a lunar colony would be right on that edge, because that's the most likely to have water, most likely to support life most likely so you can sustain yourself and not have to resupply all the time. Big game changer uh, going into it. Uh, Russia, uh, so just a little nuance on that. They were rushing, I think, the Russians were rushing, uh, <laughs> to get to the moon before India. India actually launched and did several orbits around the Earth 
and then went up to the moon, uh, Russia took a faster pace, and I think that may have caused the rush to get there to beat India the moon. So there's probably a national pride thing going on. So it's it's interesting, but definitely we'll see more. Yeah, uh, you mentioned helium-3, so the reason that's significant is uh, many people believe it could be used uh, for, I think it's a uh, fusion, uh, so energy, essentially. Um, Sam, what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, just say out, out of curiosity here, uh, the the India uh, air, uh, I mean ship, if I could say right, uh, it's it it had a rover, so that rover uh, just uh, landed the moon. Uh, it was it moved around at, at least eight meters around the ship, and it's fun because it has a, around three foot in in length. And the, the wheels, the wheels were designed uh, to imprint um, the Indian flag on the on the lunar oh, soil. Oh, I didn't know that. That's <laughs> a, such a fun fact. That's a fun fact. stamp. That is, you know, nice it's almost piece, like man. the scientists like hatching up this plan. Like, oh, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. 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 It, it, I mean, it, of course, it has all the scientific thing uh, for the the mission, but I mean, these details makes it even more interesting to to learn about. It. It's very cool. There you go. They planted the flag literally just by <laughs> imprinting it. <laughs> very cool. That's clever. I, you know, it's I hear a lot of these things though about the moon. You know, it's going to be the launch pan, pad for Mars. Um, the timelines don't seem to be long enough for what is being proposed uh, a lot of the time, though. So, but what I will say, given that there's this much national competition, I think that kind of bodes better uh, for for establishing um, bases on the moon, whether they're unmanned uh, or on crewed bases, completely automated or mostly automated. Um, or we actually are able to set up home base for humans there. So um, nice to see the moon back in the news, right? It's been a while. Um, so we're going to head on to our last article, which is our favorite topic. <laughs> so uh, generative AI. It's been the topic for almost, what, half a year now since we, uh, we kind of showcased ChatGPT on this show the weekend that it went live. Yep. Uh, GPT-3. So AI-generated art can't be copyrighted, uh, copyrighted, says a federal judge, with the potential consequences for Hollywood studios. So um, one of the issues with anything generated by a computer or generated completely automatically without user input is usually no copyright applies. Um, and we've seen elsewhere that a, a judge had ruled that you're no different than a person dictating to a contractor uh, for like a graphic design job. Like I want it to have blue, I want it to have a bird, I want it to do this and that. Um, so you're not actually the copyright holder the same way that somebody says shoot my wedding doesn't own the copyrights to the photos that are taken by the photographer. So in this case, um, AI art can't be, uh, generative art can't be copyrighted. This spells some interesting questions for movie studios. As we know, they're trying to negotiate with both actors and writers right now. So on the most basic level, an AI-generated script can literally be stolen by anyone once it's generated. So if Disney wants to generate a script to forego getting a writer, uh, if that script leaks at all, that means any movie studio or any individual can then make that movie without uh, infringing upon uh, the copyright of the script. So that's an interesting twist. And I think it puts a little bit more power uh, back into the creators. Um, but the big question that arises is uh, at what point does human involvement or editing or auditing of that script then make it Disney's own property? Right. So if they generate this script, but then they have a writer punch it up, let's say, um, at what point does it become sufficiently uh, a human property? And I don't think that was necessarily answered by this case. So 
I'm looking for any uh, additional insights. I do think it's a victory for creators, but I, with any victory for creators, it always seems to come with a double-edged sword, right? So. Yeah, I, I, Trent, I know Trent has a, a comedy he wants to make, of course, and Sam, but I want to jump in here because, you know, it's not just uh, AI, it's, it's non-humans in general, right? Because this all started with the monkey selfie dispute. And if you haven't heard about that one, a monkey literally took a picture of himself and somebody tried to copyright that and that went to court and it was like no there's no copyright this was there was there has to be human involvement in this and that was a monkey so so that precedent if you will in the law transfers over to this ai area i think what's really really interesting to me about uh the the hollywood piece of this it's not just the scripts right the reason why the actors were you know picketing and uh you know boycotting and uh you know having a strike is because the, you know, they put some things in the contract that like we can basically train our ai using your images and essentially generate images of you that aren't real and use them for all time and you guys need to be good with that and people are like no well think about that for a second just say they can do that or they do that and let's just say it's clint eastwood they make the fake ai clint eastwood generated movie uh, you know, now, according to this precedent, anybody can, you know, in turn do that. So when you think about, you know, the person whose image actually is, right? So we're kind of getting behind the AI, if you will, to, to potential, you know, victims or to the people whose image or likeness or actual art is being used, you know, that I think it just adds a whole other layer to this. So Trent, go ahead. No, no, you're absolutely right. It, it's really interesting because it's very, very cutting edge. So to give you background, Judge Howell, who's the jurist on this uh, here in the District of Columbia, she's a very knowledgeable person on technology. Uh, I've known her for over 20 years. And actually, she was a cybersecurity professional back before, you know, and a lawyer dealing with these areas before she became a judge. So she's probably one of the best jurists to have a conversation about this. But really going into it does change that is because who owns it, like you're saying, what's generated. And the other questions that come to mind is if you're using AI to develop your intellectual property, not just these images and everything else, are you, it's to Mike's point, well, at what point do you, how do I protect it? Now, an interesting thing is Google just released IDX, which is their new coding uh, language, which is AI enabled. <laughs> So is it helping you like, you know, like a certain uh, virtual assistant, I won't say, set everybody off, set everybody's phone off or something. But, um, you know, we're going, it's very interesting with consequences is this probably will help, I would think in the writer's strike in the uh, in Hollywood, um, because I'm happy if that would get over because I've seen too many shows that seem to have been written with AI right now that uh, <laughs> I'd like to get the real writers back. But then this also goes into everything else. It's it's a big impact. Like I said, with the deep fakes, once you have your voice and your image, I was just speaking at a counterterrorism conference up at NYPD last week, and this was a big concern because people committing frauds, posing as you, you call them up the phone, and it sounds like Don, but it's not Don, and somebody's just using an app with Don's voice to make things happen. So, you know, there are other concerns from the security side. What are the consequences? Yeah, for sure. Just things will make you go, hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you bring up interesting uh, points about input. Both of you did. Uh, it, the input, it, now what this case does is put the onus on the input, right? So if you purposely tried to violate a, an artist by saying, give me a section of Sarah Silverman's book, uh, and then tried to use that in whatever, uh, you know, with some slight modification, use that in your piece, we're kind of going back to traditional copyright, like, is this a collage or did you just sticker it onto a piece? Um, that's a perfect example, actually, in art, how you could use like Mickey Mouse's head. But if you put some gouache over it and modify the eyes, put dollar signs in them, suddenly it's fine art and it's OK. Right. Uh, but if you just took the Mickey Mouse sticker, you could be sued for that. So um, I think that kind of puts this back in that territory. But what you brought up, Trent, that was interesting, and I just want to finish this real quick, and then we'll go to uh, Sam's thoughts. Um, 
there's, I think, broader implications for code because sometimes there's only one way to do something in a language. And if the AI is the first to get to that, does that make it generally open source? <laughs> and you're, you know, you're, you have no legal rights uh, if you were trying to build something and you just needed the AI to answer that one last question to put together the whole app. That seems very interesting to me. So Sam, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I've been using some of them lately, right? ChatGPT, uh, GitHub, Copilot. So uh, in my opinion, uh, if I take the hat of a software developer right here, um, for me, AI is another tool. It's another tool. Anybody can use that. They can produce uh, products, you can produce images, you can produce anything, but that's you producing that because you are giving the input, right? The tool will give you the output, but that's the human behind that yet. I mean, we are um, still in control of what we want to achieve. Um, Because there are many, I would say like buzzwords around and many uh, like news, right, regarding AI. So everybody that says AI looks like everybody look at you because you just say AI. I mean, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's another tool, honestly. Um, Every time we try to use that here, it all depends what we want to achieve. So if you want the software to believe, uh, to behave in some way, right or if you want to develop another different experience for the user uh, so you give all that information as an input of course the ai will learn with your input yes so you are giving information but what you have as a result is something that okay that's what i need right instead of i spend one week or one month to get this done i just spend an hour Right. So uh, sometimes when people start to complain about copywriting, or oh, this is mine, this is not mine, this is AI generated. No, that, that's just my opinion, guys. Um, you, you know, I used the tool. I generated yeah. that. I used the tool to generate that. So that that was something I did. The same way you use a computer uh, to produce a computer code, right? So you program, you have a language. So you will type your language, the computer will generate machine code, mm-hmm. right? And, but I give the input, the computer generated machine code. So that was my result in the end, using the tool, which is a compiler. So for me, uh, like AI is the same thing. Uh, so sometimes I think people will maybe... <laughs> yeah, well, it's an interesting the- analogy. Like if you use Photoshop and you use one of the filters, right? That's just applying an algorithm to the the image. If you created the original work underneath that, there's no distinction with adding that layer with the tool that would suddenly make the thing uncopyrightable. But in this case, they're saying that that actually would be the case. So I think there's uh, there's some nuance that is lost here. Like I use GitHub Copilot uh, to do coding, and the amount of boilerplate it removes that, or actually, it makes made me think that things that weren't boilerplate because I used to have to think of the logic and then call back to that thing that's in another file. That's a whole layer that just becomes boilerplate that it generates for you because it's learned from the way that you structure your application. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think there's going to be some nuance from here, but uh, in terms of fully finished creative works, I think if from top to bottom, um, I think that's going to be very different than 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 products generated by this. Yeah, I'm going to take this um, monkey analogy to a whole new level. You know, like it really comes down to this meaningful human input. What? what how are we defining that? Right to Sam's uh-huh. point. You know, is it meaningful just to put in a couple of keywords and then the thing generates itself? You know, the, obviously this article says, and, and this case kind of said no. You know, what what if I, uh, I as the human, you know, I hand the monkey the camera, you know, I've trained the monkey to use the camera. I give that monkey specific commands on what I want that monkey to do, take a selfie, you know, is that good enough? And, you know, I don't know that answer because it's really no different than handing a monkey a camera, 
uh, and training it to do things as, you know, with same thing with AI, you know, at what point is it good enough for copyright purposes to, you know, for, for that human and, and at what level of involvement is, as Mike, as you said, just putting on, you know, kind of the glossing touches, is that good enough? Plus the, uh, the input on the front end? I don't know. I think we'll, we'll find out soon enough because the right case. I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with like music law and sampling and, and the way that that stuff goes. Um, a perfect uh, recent case was, um, oh, what's his name? The redhead. Um, Eric No, not the, <laughs> singer, singer. A singer? Ed Sheeran. Oh, Ed, Ed Sheeran. Sheeran. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so basically he's being sued um, over the use of a song, uh, Let's Get It On. Oh, yeah, yeah, Marvin Gaye, and then he played his guitar in court and all that. They got a free song. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny. I've, I I looked up a recent lawsuit also on drum patterns, and I was like, how do you sue for a drum pattern? And what happened was the defendant was unable to say, to prove that that drum pattern had existed elsewhere in history before. Um the sample that he used and that that was that's like landmark because in most cases you could say oh there's hundreds of other musicians that have used this before and after so how could you sue them and that's probably going to be where the ed sheeran defense ends up so like with this it just kind of gets into that murky territory of because this new tool has changed the ability to create creative works faster uh by taking the inputs of previous artists now we kind of are in like a fuzzy gray area of of you know determining what is meaningful human input before a lawsuit could go through uh whereas before it was a little bit more clean cut um or it wasn't we just had worked it out over 50 years of copyright lawsuits and and now we're kind of like undermined again a little bit any other final thoughts uh from anybody it makes my head hurt really when you think about it because uh there are these copyright trolls out there i know i'm a victim of one oh. by the way true story uh if you look on my website now there are like zero images on my articles page purposefully because i took them all down and deleted them all uh you know because now they have these bots out there that comb through the internet and say oh look here's here's a you know an associated press image uh, you know, do you have a license to use that? And then they come after you hard for money. And, uh, you know, sadly they can, but think, take it to the next level. You know, it's not just a photo that the Associated Press took or whatever it is. Like, say it's a little snippet of something, you know, you put in an article or to Mike's point, you put in a song, you know, and, and it's just somewhere, you know, in your world, your digital world, whether it's on your YouTube channel or whether it's on your website and and it's minuscule but it's there they're going to find it and i'm telling you these these copyright trolls uh have a lot of job security right now with ai and it's only going to get worse and bigger so everyone out there buyer beware like don't put images out there or information unless you know actually where it came from and you have a uh, written permission or a license to use it mm -hmm. Well, that, that actually brings up something interesting, Don, because, um, you know, um, both you and Trent had talked about inputs a little bit. Um, so, like, to bring it back to music, if you want to get a sample now, you go to a, a sample service like Splice. Or if you want to get a stock photo, you go to Shutterstock, you go to Adobe Stock. Yep. And all the licensing for those images has been worked out. With this AI stuff, they're scraping sometimes things illegally, and they've been caught scraping things illegally that were behind copyright laws, uh, walls, or they scraped it from a site that had already stolen it, which, by the way, they're still responsible. You can't just traffic in the stolen goods and then put it into your um, model for analysis. Um, so if the output generates a perfect kind of um, copy of the original input, which these generative models and these LLM models are claiming is not possible, that's been disproven. If you put in the right prompts with the right tweaks, you could get an image that is 98% the training image. Remember if we you saw those, Mike, the it. Disney ones, where you know, they right. took the Disney princesses and then they made like, you know, new ones. 
No, but those so that that can definitely be considered an augmentation. I'm saying you could if you put in the right keywords and you hit the system enough, you could actually come back with the Cinderella image itself. Oh. And it's only a few pixels off I here and there. So at that point, you to use the output from the AI puts you in legal gray zones because if it's close enough to the original work, you're actually violating the copyright regardless of the tool you used. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You just didn't know that you're violating copyright as you did it. it you know, so you're kind of rolling the dice when you use these tools. You know, if I was advising a young uh, law student right now, I'd say uh, dive into AI and learn everything you can about copyright because I think this is going to be job security for lawyers for years to come for these copyright trolls. There's an entire industry around this today. Yeah. Imagine what this is going to be like <laughs> a year to five years from now. Oh. Well, I look forward to it. What else do we have coming up uh, that the audience should be looking forward to? Wow, so much going on. Uh, so this Wednesday on the Daughter Drones, we have Dr. Laquata Sumter. Uh, she is part of the Vladis Above and Beyond series and our last guest for this building program success theme. Uh, Thursday, uh, we think about this on our clubhouse. Oh, we have Tony Drummond from Titan Aviation kicking off a brand new month dedicated to the future of flight. Uh, and we're going to be carrying that into commercial UAV next week. So hope to see some of you in Las Vegas. We've got a live stream from the booth with Dragonfly on Tuesday. We've got a live stream from the floor on Thursday with our normal Donna drones with Tony on Wednesday. It's going to be an insane week. And oh, by the way, if you're going to Vegas and you haven't signed up for the Kerasoft P3 Tech networking happy hour on Monday night at Carnival Court from seven to nine, do it up. Uh, go to my website. It's on the front page. You can register now. Uh, we'd love to see you there. We've got a lot of people signed up. I'm just going to leave it at that right now. We'd love to see more. All right. That's all we got for the show today. I want to thank our um, sponsors, Aero Vigilance, CSG Strategies, Rupert Law, and Drone Up. I want to thank our audience for participating today. Hey, Desi, I see you there. Great information. So many don't think about copyright, she says. Um, so. We also have a LinkedIn user that said hi to Trent, so I just want to call them out. Thank you, everybody, for participating. So thank you to our speakers. That is it. We are out.